and welcome to Bread and Thread, a podcast about food and domestic history. I'm Liz. I'm Hazel. We're two people who studied archaeology together and love history. So what have you been up to this week? Trapped <laughs> inside. So, I mean, I guess the upside of this, as like with a lot of people I'm hearing, is I've been getting a lot of making stuff done. So there's that, but also, you know, it's nice to have social interaction. Um, but, you know, I can replace that with crafts and bread. I made bread. Oh, what kind of bread did you make? Um, well, I haven't made bread in a while, so it was just like a sort of basic um, white loaf. But mm. I'm planning to finally get a sourdough starter going oh i I love my sourdough starter his his name is dorian gray because he does not change as he ages (laughs) how old is he now um almost two years i have a toddler yeah there's there's a toddler in a jar in my fridge and it's made of yeast (laughs) <laughs> is it going to be heartrending when he finally goes to school I, I'm not ready I'm not ready for him to leave home <laughs> uh, at least you have a few years before that happens mm. oh. I've also been I've also made bread oh we've, cool we made some um, poppy seed bagels okay that's a bit because I like yeah. bagels <laughs> that sounds amazing it was very bread good. Were, we're syncing up this week. I've I've been doing both bread and thread. Ooh. I've I've made bread and I Yeah, I've been doing a a lot of yarn things because I managed to sprain my toe taking some rubbish out. Oh no. <laughs> so I've just been on the sofa distracting myself from my foot. That's like the least cool reason to be injured. Yeah. There's just a wet patch in the yard. <laughs> oh no. And yeah. Don't sprain your toes, kids. It's not fun. Yeah, don't don't do that. Or at least do but it. It cool did way. also give me plenty of time to research, and I tell you, I am jam packed with information. Uh, is it because we're yeah, talking, we're talking about jam? It is. Um, I can't believe you just did that. How long have you known me? <laughs> <laughs> like you've Good known point. me longer than my spouse has known me. Yeah, yeah, okay, tell me about jam then. Okay, so... You know, at least make it a fruity explanation. Okay, um, so the actual, the oldest reference that we have to preserving fruits is actually in a 1st century collection of recipes by Apicius, mm-hmm. um, which is also the second oldest collection of recipes that we have, just at all. The oldest? The second oldest. The oldest is Acadian clay tablets. <laughs> I was not expecting that. Yeah. <laughs> Like that's, this is first civilization stuff. That's some some seriously old bread, but, and I assume it was bread. Or, um, I mean the, the recipes that I managed to find because I can't find just a translation. But okay. there's um there's a stew, and there's some sort of fancy foul um. Kind almost like an hors d'oeuvre kind of thing, like a little fancy like 
you take one and you go on with your day kind of thing. Um, with ten different seasonings. <laughs> That's definitely fancier <coughs> than I expected. But there's there's some stuff where culture is definitely a barrier because there's a lot of recipes on these tablets that mention meat water, which some people think is probably stock, but we don't actually know. I I'm gonna start calling stock meat water now. I mean, it's it's not inaccurate. It's just it's meat flavored water. <laughs> Fill up the stew with some good old meat water. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah. Tell, what? What? What about but the Apicius? Yes. Um. So, in chapter twelve of the Art of Cooking, there's a whole bunch of different fruit preservation things, including boiling pomegranates in seawater and just hanging them up. And apparently, that's fine. I. That doesn't sound delicious. And just straight up pickling peaches. Ooh. Oh no. It's... I mean, I know pickled plums is a thing. Is it? I mean, I guess. But that the... sounds bad. Yeah, fruit and savoury is a thing, but I guess it depends which fruit. I mean, I guess like strawberries and balsamic vinegar is a thing. Yes. That is good. So, like. Fruit and vinegar, maybe? Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of other fruits that he basically recommends put it in a jar with honey and wine. That sounds better. Um, including figs, apples, cherries, quinces, which will be relevant later. Never relevant. And, and also things like... Um, Yeah, like plums as well. Mm. So pretty much any fruit you can get your hand on. But I just found it interesting because the idea of of doing this thing of like sweetness and and wine, which would presumably become vinegar, just really reminded me of Plowman's pickle. Oh, which is what? like is onion and one? apple in like a vinegary thing. Okay, I never knew what was in that before. So I'm, I'm just wondering if that's just something that's just kept going, is this idea of preserving onion and apple in vinegar. Okay. Also, um, we but he does mention... About... We should talk about the Plowman's Lunch at some point, because that's like an interesting... That would be a very good local larder. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he does mention one thing that does actually sound like jam, um, which is mulberries cooked in wine and their own juices, and then sealed in a jar. A mulberry is particularly juicy. Or high oh yeah, like it's mulberries are one of the ones that you make wine from. Okay, you can make mulberry wine, so they're very juicy. Mm. And I mean, most berries are very good at setting once you've boiled them up. I don't think I've ever had a mulberry. I don't think I have either, but I I know that mulberry wine is a thing. So I did learn the other day that apparently, I think it was King James, tried to start a silk industry in Britain by like paying a couple to look after some mulberry trees and try and make silk, but it, it didn't work. Is that because he didn't have silkworms? I think they did. They d it just the the silkworms didn't like it because nobody likes the English climate. That's fair. I think they have to be at a very specific temperature at some or something. Um, mm. Mm. But yeah, I just find find that quite interesting that we do have actual evidence of jam. Yeah, that's kind older of than before refined sugar. Oh, that's older than I expected jam to be. Although certain fruits have higher, like, setting pectin content than others, right? Yeah, because um, I have actually made jam, and I I saw basically if you um, if you're using berries, a lot of the time you don't actually need pectin. Yeah, yeah, depending on what, or you can put 
Does putting lemon in work? I don't know. I did put lemon in mine, but that's because it was blueberry jam. And my standard go-to with blueberries is lemon and brown sugar, like if I'm baking with them. Mm. Okay. Um, my grandma always put lemon, but I can't remember if she said it did anything. I mean, it presumably makes it taste good. Yeah. <laughs> but with the fall of the Roman Empire, like a lot of things, um, Europe forgot how to make jam by the look of it. Oh, um, lost then, ancient knowledge. But then... We went and dicked around in the Middle East and were horrible people and stole the making of jam. Was there a jam renaissance? There was a jam renaissance. Mary, Queen of Scots' doctor, gave her marmalade as a treatment for seasickness. <laughs> There's a well, wonderful folk etymology um, which claims that marmalade comes from... Um, Marie Esmalade, oh. but it's probably just from the Portuguese word for quince. Wow, <laughs> that's a good story though. Yeah, told you quince will come back later. <laughs> just every time you have marmalade now, you can think of Mary Queen of Scots throwing up. Yeah, but quince was like the big thing for making jam with in this, at this period. Is there a reason for that or...? There's a lot of it about, and it's not hugely nice on okay. its own. Yeah, is is quince the one that is basically rotten before you eat it? Or... Yeah, it's like a weird little wrinkly apple. Weird. As yep. featured in The Owl and the Pussycat. Actually, the fact that oh. they eat quince with a spoon in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've that seen owl. some suggestions that they're actually eating quince marmalade. Okay. Oh. But the idea of um, us getting back the concept of jam through marmalade, I think, is quite interesting, especially because the words are the same in Spanish. They call yeah. both mermelada. Ah. So, do, I guess, would that mean we nicked it from the Spanish? I mean, the Spanish probably nicked it from the Middle East. That makes sense. Spain is they, known they, were, they were big into crusades. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> but Spain is still quite well known for marmalade, right? Uh, yes, Seville marmalade. With, um, made with, with their special kind of oranges. Hmm, I never knew where that was. That's so cool. Yeah, it's this is... This whole just chain of just the concept of jam going back and forth across the Mediterranean, <laughs> basically. New history of the world through jam. <laughs> jam roads. <laughs> that would be so bad for the horses. Oh, <laughs> they would be so sticky. Oh, God, imagine the sound. <laughs> <laughs> dangerous to track the jam roads. <laughs> it's dangerous to go alone. Take this. Hands you a slice of toast. <laughs> uh, at least you'd never starve on them. So, not a lot happens with jam for a while. Um, and then Welch's who you've probably heard of, they they make juice. They're probably most well-known for juice in the UK. I haven't. Um, oh, they used to have this really weird advert with people dressed in like different colours to represent the different fruit, and then they get in giant glasses. It was very weird. Um, but they created grape jam. Um which they sold as grape laid so grape marmalade, wow. which I feel is a really horrible name, 
but in their defense, it was like 1918. I think it would be a lovely girl's name. <laughs> um, and then the US Army basically went, hey, preserved fruit, that's a great idea. Bought the whole batch and gave it to the army. Wow. <laughs> um, which obviously was very useful. They sold it all. Ah. Um, they changed the name to Concord, and they still sell Concord's grape jelly in the oh, US. Okay. Wow. I think that's quite cool. Yeah. I mean, I personally am not a fan of grape products. Don't think I've ever had a grape jam or a grape jelly. Can you just can you explain the distinction between jelly and jam? Um, it's to do with having like actual bits of fruit in it. So, what we think of as jelly. It's a similar texture too. It's just kind of a bit thicker and spreadable. Mm. Whereas okay, jam is, is more of like a preserve where it's got actual bits of fruit in it. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, I'm, I much prefer blackcurrant, but blackcurrant is largely illegal in the US. Is blackcurrant illegal in the US? So it's an invasive species. Oh. So it's illegal to plant in most of the US because it's also very aggressive, like mint levels of aggressive spreading of the plants. Wow. <laughs> so there's like I think there's one county where they you can have blackberry plants. Which is why grape flavor is such a thing in the US, because it's basically here's a purple flavour. So they have grape where we have black currant. Oh, I feel so bad that I don't get black currant. Do they not have Ribena? Only in the shops that sell British stuff. Um, and like having had grape flavoured pop, I'm I'm gonna stick to my Ribena and my Vimto, I think. <laughs> like it's all right, but black currant's better. Okay. Which might, might just be because it's what I'm used to, but in my opinion, black currant is superior to grape. Currant is delicious. Ribena does have about as much sugar as a pot of jam in it, though. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do like Vimto though. It's a very rounded flavor because it's got a lot of other stuff in. I yeah, think Vimto one of the things Vimto has in it is grape, actually, but it's mostly black currant. Mm. Vimto does have a lo a lovely uh, mouth feel. The, the word or the substance? Yes. <laughs> That's fair. I mean, you know, as a Mancunian, I've got to be loyal to Vimto. Okay. It's, it's the Manchester drink. <laughs> it was invented here. We have a statue of a Vimto bottle in our city <laughs> centre. Where is it? It's near Piccadilly Station. How have I not seen this Vimto statue? <laughs> Next time you're in Manchester, I will show you the Vimto statue. Can you please take me on a pilgrimage to the Vimto statue? <laughs> but anyway, um, so Jam doesn't really change much from that point. Um, there's obviously new aseptic canning methods to let it last longer. And again, in the US, high fructose corn syrup. So, or here we use glucose fructose syrup. In well, in the cheaper jams, the more expensive ones tend to just have like actual sugar. So this is why jam basically just doesn't go off if you don't open it, because there's a lot more sugar than there used to be, and sterile canning. Yeah. And that is the story of jam. Ow. I feel enlightened. That is, there were so many that I mean, that truly was jam packed. There's a lot of twists and turns in the story of jam. I feel <laughs> there are unexpectedly so. I I was not sure when our lovely listener Jeremy recommended this topic that there would be a lot to say. Turns out there's a lot to say. <laughs> turns, turns out the deeper you dig, the more jam there is. 
So genuinely, thank you for recommending that, Jeremy. Yeah, that was great. I I, I learned a lot. <laughs> so did I. <laughs> and and I hope you did too. Jeremy. Um so before we move on to local ladder, I want to remind everyone that we do have a Patreon. Um if you want to support us, you can go to patreon.com slash bread and threads um, for patron rewards such as recipes, um, including my lovely Banoffee cookies, and access to the bread and thread server where we can talk food and crafts and you know anything else. It's it's just gonna be a chill space. Uh it's, it's gonna be wholesome. So Hazel, what have you been been learning about this week? <laughs> okay, um, I have for you uh, the story of the fat rascal, or the fat rascal, if I'm being Yorkshire, which apparently I am. The fat um, rascal. Yeah, the fat rascal. So this is a, a slightly legendary Yorkshire cake. It's like kind of a cross between a scone and a rock cake, if that makes sense. Um, okay. Like it's not going to break your teeth, but it's it's got a bit of bite to it. Um, but it's the same kind of thing. Like it's made just with flour and currants, essentially. Well, and some more things, but like. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's a currency cake. It, it is, yeah. It's it's like flour, butter, sugar, currants, essentially. Okay. Um, it is definitely strongly associated with Yorkshire. I've not really seen it for sale anywhere else. Apparently, it's mentioned a couple of other places in the UK, but I mean, definitely... I've I've lived in multiple northern counties and only ever encountered th- this phrase in Yorkshire. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's a great name. I don't, I couldn't really find much information on how it got that name, but it's a great name, um, the Fat Rascal. I am wondering if there's anything like the singing hinny you get in Northumberland. Ah, now apparently Charles Dickens did. Oh, okay. <laughs> did like kind of lump them in together. <laughs> <laughs> which I like and I didn't know about the singing honey until I, f- I feel like I've I've got back I've got back my northern credentials now <laughs> you, do, you are peak north right now <laughs> I'm I'm definitely feeling um you've alphaed me <laughs> <laughs> um it's it appeared in the 19th century um as far as recipes of it go back under that name um, but apparently it's kind of a descendant of turf cakes, which are little little cakes that were cooked like in the ashes of a fire on an upturned pan or something, which is a fairly sort of cost effective um, way to use up bits of flour and currants and things. But it appears in the 19th century as a thing that people are making as a fat rascal. Um, and it's pretty much the same recipe until Betty's got involved. And is that is that of Harrogate? Yes, it is indeed. Now, if you don't know about Betty's, Betty's is like the most famous tea room in Northern England. I, I think it's fair to say. I I would say most famous tea room just in England. Yeah. Like the I'm... only other tea room I can think of right now is one in Glasgow. Oh yeah, the um, Willow. Yeah, that's what it's called. Um But I okay, yeah. I mean, I've definitely never heard anything else referred to as like a particularly famous tea room. So Betty's is kind of incredible. Uh, it's like a very very fancy tea room with cakes and tea and all sorts there's one in full-on cream teas 
oh yeah like proper green teas um, there's one in york and one in harrogate i can't remember which was the first one i assume harrogate <laughs> if it's betty's of harrogate okay um but the one in york is quite quite big as well and it's very mm. fancy right? there's actually two in york <laughs> is there oh yeah there's one on stonegate it's a really there? small one yeah okay tiny betty's excellent um so betty's um when me and liz were students in york we used to go and like basically press our noses against the window of betty's like poor victorian orphans and look at all the delicious cakes inside because they were also very expensive not an inaccurate <laughs> description this yeah. time of year they've also got very expensive very fancy easter eggs oh yeah the easter displays are amazing one year they had there was like a giant easter egg um with like things painted on it uh, yeah that was great um there's also always like massive queues of tourists outside but um yeah in 1983 betty's decided to start making fat rascals um and their kind of twist on it is they put cherries and almonds on top um which is like a signature thing um, do they and still call them fat rascals? Because that do. doesn't feel very Betty's. I mean, you wouldn't think so, but I think they're cashing in on the Yorkshire thing. So, oh, they, okay. yeah, they do call them fat rascals. It's authentic. Uh, oh, yeah, authentic Yorkshire. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they are the best seller at Betty's, apparently. Hmm. They sell over 375,000 fat rascals per year. Wow. <laughs> Which is a large number of cakes. That's a lot of butter. That is, that is a lot of rascals. And apparently, this, <laughs> this is something I did not expect to hear today, but um, they own the registered trademark for the name Fat Rascal. Oh, that's not right. <laughs> Which I feel like, how could you possibly enforce that? Like, can you imagine someone from Betty's going into a bakery in Yorkshire and being like, I'm sorry, you can't call those fat rascals. Like, they would probably get pelted out of the shop with fat rascals. Probably. <laughs> but, yeah, that that is some information. Mm. Yeah, if you want to stick it to the man, go and make a fat rascal in your home and then tweet a picture of it to Betty's. And tag us in it, why not? <laughs> Bread and thread <laughs> made me do it. Reclaim the fat rascal. <laughs> <laughs> so, that yeah, that is the short and beautiful history of the fat rascal. That is great. I kind of want one. <laughs> I know. I kind of want one now. There's a few recipes <laughs> online. Um, Sainsbury's has a recipe which has a, a lot of things in it, weirdly enough, but I'm pretty sure you can just make them with like currants, butter, flour, and sugar. Mm. Um, yeah, I might have to go make some. It, it, it does sound like the kind of the Yorkshire Welsh cake, and I do make a very good Welsh cake. Ooh, okay. That I think that's the one for next time. The Welsh cake. Is that is that the the local larder that I'm researching then? I, I think it. Well, if you would like to. Why not? It means I get to say cake a lot. <laughs> Which I've been told is the word that I sound the most northern when I say. <laughs> I don't have to do it in a Welsh accent if you're making Welsh cakes. I can't do a Welsh accent. I can say some things in Welsh, but I can't do a Welsh accent unless I'm speaking Welsh. <laughs> that's that's probably quite right. <laughs> <laughs> so we hope you enjoyed today's episode. Um, if you have an episode suggestion or a local louder suggestion, you can email us at breadandthreadpodcast at gmail.com please do or you can tweet us um we'd love to see pictures of anything that you make or bake especially um, if they're fat rascals especially 
Um, yeah. You can tweet at us at Bread and Thread. And as I said, don't forget to check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash bread and thread for all sorts of lovely bonuses. And we will speak to and you next we'll time. And we'll see you next time. Yeah, see you next time.